hit record. Awesome. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that. So today's lecture is over something that um, you guys have already dealt with. And so the cool part is you have a little bit of experience using validation so far. Um, but Rails, we have a lot of extra pieces that come into play. So our two big overarching goals for the day, um, one is to understand how we can add validations to our application so that we protect our database from having bad data added to it. Um, the second goal of today's is to show our user good solid error messages. Um, I know a lot of you guys in Sinatra built, both use active record validations and built in your own validations. Um, and one of the things that might have been a little bit hard about doing it in Sinatra is um, you might not have been able to display error messages. So that will kind of be our big focus for today. Um, in your experience, I just want a little bit of a share out from you guys. What have you used validations for so far? What are some examples of times you've needed to validate something? Oh, I used it when I was validating an email to make sure that only one email was entered into the system. So validated email for uniqueness. Perfect. Great example, Anna. Um, anything else that you guys validated for? Um, I validated to make sure an input submitted by a user was a number. Ah, perfect. Yeah, so there are some other validations that we really want to make sure that are there. Um, I think another really common one is that we just want to make sure that the field is filled in. Um, we don't want to have a username of nothing. And so those are some of our basic validations. Um, one of the things that we are going to work with today and Rails, I just have to tell you, some of their guides are so helpful. When I started with Rails, I didn't understand how helpful they are. They were. Um, and now, looking back, whenever I get ready to like teach on something, like this has all of the info you could almost ever need about validations. So I'm going to go ahead and share it out. Um, I know documentation can be a little intimidating. Um, it is a really good practice to get in a habit of looking at the validation whenever you are looking at the validation, looking at the documentation whenever you're getting ready to implement something um, because there might be better ways to do it than you even thought about or there might be really helpful things in here. Um, so essentially to add validations to a project, um, it's gonna be pretty simple. Active record has a way that we can add them in the model. So you might have, we've got our same project up here, um, that we've used before. You might have in your Sinatra project needed to do some sort of check to make sure all of the params were filled in before creating it. And you might have had something um, that looked a little bit like if params, uh, this will be a little bit weird, shoo, um, let's say dot any, you know, and then we iterate through the params and that would be key and values, any of the values dot blank, then you would wanna send them back and redirect them back to the new page. That was kind of a little bit of the, I don't know, write it the old school way. This is how we would have seen it before and then otherwise do the good stuff. We're gonna follow a little bit close to the same logic where we will have logic to say, if we've done it correctly, go on. If we don't do it correctly, send them back. Um, but we will edit it a little bit from there because instead of dealing with these validations where we check it ourselves, we're going to use what Active Record has built in and we're going to add validations to our model. Um, so let's say I did the very first thing I wanted to validate for was I just wanted to validate for presence. I believe we can go down into this little guide and find the one that allows us to choose presence. And here we'll get some useful information about the way that we write this validation. And so you can even check out right here where it's located so we can see that they did this in a model class. So I will come over to my model and we will add some validations here at the top. And we're gonna start simple, so we will just validate for presence. Um, and when we do validate for presence, as you can see, they just list the attributes that they want first. 
So I want them to always fill out a brand and I want them to always fill out a color and I want them to always fill out a price. The nice thing about these is we can um, just list them like this one after the other. Looks really well when they're all going for the same attribute. Technically, you can also tag on uniqueness true. Um, we, don't, we don't need these to all be unique, but if we wanted all three to both be present and we wanted all three to be unique, this syntax works. Um, I'm a big fan of sticking to one type of validation per group or, or vice versa, like, or um, maybe I only wanted the brand to be unique, but instead going one attribute at a time if you're going to do double. Let me rephrase because I don't know if that makes sense what I'm saying. If you're going to validate for more than one attribute, then only include one thing that you're checking for. If you're going to validate for more than one thing, um, then only include one attribute. Kind of a vice versa, because otherwise it can get really complicated quickly. Um, but so for right now, we'll just do presence. We're not going to deal with um, uniqueness yet. We're going to start simple, and then we'll add to this and hopefully get to some custom validations. So many of you guys have probably seen this. You might have even saw this in Sinatra and didn't really know what it was doing. Um, but this here is going to prevent us from creating a shoe unless we have those pieces added in. And to show you kind of what this looks like, we're actually just going to go into the console. And we do have our form that we could fill out in our server. But as this loads, I want to see how we can check for validations. Actually, as this is loading, I'll, I'll put that out to you guys. We are going to make a shoe that's invalid. Um, what are some of the commands that we can use that would check if our shoe is going to uh, be valid? What are some commands that we can use that will run the validations? That might be a better way of putting it. Well, I've got some things in my chat. Uh, yes, Miss Albert. So you've hit uh, on two of the big ones. There are some other ones. Yes, we can check. You're, you're, you're um, adding in some good stuff there, Lucy, getting ahead of us. But yes, we can check what's wrong with errors. I'm going to show you a few ways to check what's wrong. So let's go ahead and we're just going to make a new shoe. We don't have a name. We'll, we will fill in the brand, um, but let's leave most of the other stuff. I think I have condition. We'll fill in condition. So this right here would be an invalid shoe, right? Um, if we want to run validations, we have to either call dot valid or we have to actually commit this to the database. So the two commands that Neff Elbert added to the chat, dot valid or dot save, will both try to add this to the database. Another thing that will try to add this to the database is if we use dot create. And so any three of those commands are going to try to run your validations automatically um, and will and save and create will add it to the database if it succeeds. So I'm going to set this equal to an S. And we can see it did not get added to the database. I actually was kind of surprised I didn't even see the SQL of it rolling back. So let's see if we have any errors. Okay, we do. Perfect. Um, and yes, Nith Albert up, dot update is another one. Thank you. Um, that will check the database to make sure that it's valid. You have, you have to be a little bit, actually, now that I asked you guys this question, it's in here. So let me just show you guys. It is in here somewhere. When does validations happen? Look, they answer all of the questions that you want. Uh, these will all save things to the database and also check the validations. Um, if you use dot valid, it will just check to see if it's valid. It won't save it. Um, I do want to point this out because every once in a while, I see people in their project use things like update all or update attribute or update column. These are all ones that I would stay away from because they will skip your validations. So they won't actually um, check your validations like the other ones will. So stick to these main commands. 
Um, so with that being said, we now have this really, really handy thing. If something doesn't save to the database, we now have this added dot errors um, that we can look at that essentially, if you look at it, it's basically like an object that has these instance variables that tells us what the errors are. And specifically, if we look at our messages, we get this really useful hash. So if I do dot messages, we get this really useful hash that tells us both the attribute and what went wrong, the attribute and what went wrong, um, which works out very nicely for displaying an error message to the user. Um, this is a really good way if you get frustrated and you have added validations and you don't understand why things are not um, saving in your Rails project, using that errors is really helpful. Another thing that is kind of helpful is um, up here you saw all those exclamation marks. Those exclamation marks, all they do is they're going to return to you uh, why it didn't save. And so right in this one line where it's going to basically raise an error if it doesn't save and you're going to understand why it doesn't save. The same thing would be true with dot save. So if I put an exclamation mark here, um, we will get that same error message. What do you guys think, because this is going to be useful to us in a second, the return value will be if I do s.save on this invalid object. Ah, oh, we've got a guess for a Boolean and a guess for a nil, which is also a really good guess too, because it's not going to save to the database. Those would be the two things that I would be thinking of. So let's go ahead and try to save it. So we did get false. Um, but nil's kind of along the same lines, but we did get a, a, a truthy value. And the reason I want to point this out is because this is going to be really useful to us is that dots dot create doesn't necessarily give us a truthy value. It was returning the object to us. Even when it didn't create it, it returned the object to us. Um, but in this case, we are actually getting a truthy value. Now, what if I actually add, um, Let's add the other attributes that we need here. So a color, we'll call these shoes blue. And let's add a price. Uh, we'll call them $75, why not? And now if I try to save, what do we think the return value will be? Yeah, Lucy, I think you're getting it. You see the point that I'm trying to get at is we will get true. So it adds our, and now we see that it has, it has been added to the database. Um, so it gets added to the database and it gives us true back. And I just want to point that out um, is that save will always give a true or a false value. So we can use it in our check um, on the controller side to say if it saves, do something. If it doesn't save, do something else, since save will always give us a true or false value. Very similar, you can also always do dot valid, and that will return true or false. It just doesn't add in the save portion um, or adding it to the database. So I'm, I'm a big fan of using that. So if we want to, now that we have a validation, we're going to rewrite this so it, it fits kind of our new way of thinking. So our new way of thinking is we are not going to create this at first. We are just going to instantiate it. And that way we can actually do a check like we did in here to see if our shoe saves. So our logic would look a little bit like if our shoe saves, remember that not, not a question mark, not a question mark, um, but this will return a true or false value. Then we can send them on their way and the shoe will have been added to the database. If it doesn't save, we want to send them somewhere else. Um, in the past, this has been a redirect. We are now going to change that, and we are no longer going to redirect. Instead, we are just going to render the new view. Um, anyone that maybe is a little bit ahead and has read about this so far, 
why are we going to now render instead of redirect here? Because we want info about our errors. And as we saw in here before, and I don't think it will have the information, no, it doesn't have any errors anymore because it did save, but we want to be able to access the instance.errors, and we can only access that if we have access to this instance. One other thing is going to have to change here. Because I want information about this in my view, I'm going to have to make that an instance variable everywhere that I've mentioned it. Because now I actually care about, okay, if it doesn't save, I want to be able to look at at shoe.errors in my new view and figure out what's going wrong. Um, so we'll need that in our vendor new. We're also going to need a way to display these error messages. So let's go ahead and we will jump into our server and we'll trigger these. Um, I told you guys this documentation is my favorite. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. And partly why it's my favorite is it also tells you how to display your error messages. So uh, working with validation errors and look at this, displaying validation errors and views. So let's say you forgot all your lessons and you had no idea how to, dis how to iterate over a hash and display errors. Well, nice, lucky for you, they have already given you the code that you need to use. And so we are gonna go add to our view, our new view that we're re-rendering, essentially this chunk of code and this chunk of code you can tell that they did it with a certain object they did it specifically with an article we are not going to do it with an article we're going to do it with a shoe but so i'm just going to replace all instances of when they've said article and i have this beautiful code in here um, now it is important you never drag and drop code into your project without knowing what it's doing so let's make sure we understand what this does line by line. So our first line right here, we're bringing in our shoe object that we tried to create. If this shoe hasn't been created yet, it will just be this brand new blank instance and it won't have any errors and all of this will get skipped. So when we first load the view, we won't see this. And I'll even show this to you over here. Uh, let's go to shoes.new. When we first load this, we don't get any hint of any of this div. And the reason we don't see this div is because our brand new instance of a shoe has no errors. If it does have errors, it's going to add this HTML inside of here. Then what it's going to do is we're going to use this handy dandy method from um, some of the Active Record Ruby extensions that have been added to go ahead and tell us how many errors. So the way this works is we take in an argument of a number. So it could be one error, two error, three error, and then it will pluralize this word. So it will say one error, or it will say two errors prohibit, prohibited this shoe from being saved. Um, and then we'll actually iterate over what we saw in here earlier, that hash, I don't know where my hash went. Uh, here we go. We're gonna be iterating over this hash. Um, and actually this one is a little bit different because we call full messages. And what full messages does, I should have shown you while we were still in there, is it basically um, joins the key and the value together. So full messages looks a little bit like color can't be blank and price can't be blank. And so our message will now say color can't be blank or price can't be blank. Um, why can you use dot any on errors? No, Lucy, that's a really good question that I never really stopped to think about. To be honest, it's probably the way that they built errors, which it, errors is kind of interesting because we call different like instance methods off of it as if it's a singular thing. But then it's also, you can tell that there are multiple of them because we can count them and we can call dot any like they're an array, but they also don't show up in here like an array. I don't know, Lucy, that's really, I think 
it must be the unique way that they've like designed errors to work. Uh, they made it flexible for certain methods. Some, uh, Do you have insight some on that? Weird, some weird magic going on here. There yeah. Is. You'll, you'll see this sometimes, I feel like in Rails a lot, where you expect something to be an array or an object, but what I imagine it is, is it's a function that is asking, well, what's calling me? And I don't, I'm not exactly sure if that's how it works, but that's just my assumption that <clears throat> errors can tell if, depending on what, uh, what, the, like, what a following request for a method would be, and then it determines its behavior in that way, but not 100%. So like, if you call like any on it, it knows to oh, like act like an array. Exactly. Yeah, that is a great question. I And it could even be that it's something that they have made um, to, to act in different ways, but that is odd. Um, now that I'm I don't know. I would have to, I haven't really like di dived into the, uh, the inner workings of um, errors, but I'm now, I'm, now I'm really curious, Lucy. So great question. Um, but right now let's call it some Rails magic. Uh, I, I don't have an answer for you. Um, but essentially what full messages will do is it will join this to automatically take your attribute that had the error and say can't be blank. So if we wanna see this in practice, um, it's gonna look a little bit like, we'll come over here, we can leave some of these uh, messed up and we'll put in a color and we'll go ahead and create our shoe. How does that feel like it didn't do anything? Uh, it did render our shoe new, why didn't it show me our error messages? Everything's up to date, nothing new to do. There is something new to do. And that is to show my error messages. Why is it not picking this up? At shoe.errors. We have tried to save it. It should, I'm gonna put a binding prime here because we should have errors. I don't know why they're not showing. I've done this so many times before and never had that where it just magically didn't appear. Yeah, we've got errors. And then I can even show you at shoe.error messages, not full messages, errors.full messages, at shoe.errors.any. I think I've got something where it's caching what I had before and not showing me a new page because it's rendering new, yeah. which is odd. What did we even do? Let's just try to create a blank one. You know, I'm trying to, um, I'm gonna right click that. What's how? Do, what's the, uh, the command to do the hard refresh? Did I put this in the right new? Yep. Why is it not showing me? I only have a incognito window. Okay. Wait, did you click it? Huh. Yeah. Weird. I wonder if it has something to do with Webpacker. Because I feel like that's what's causing it to say nothing new to do. Maybe I never have. Stopping and restarting the server. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, but I'll do it. I've never had that happen before. But I also usually don't run Rails 6. So. Oh. Yeah, that's also true. <clears throat> I always run Rails 4. 
and I finally figured I should, <laughs> I should upgrade. Crazy. Let's go back to your HTML, your ERB file. Yeah, this should be fine. Like I've never done anything ever different than this, which is why it's so weird. Let's just see if it's updating like anything. Okay. But it's not, it's like, because I'm rendering new and I've already rendered new, it like doesn't want to do anything. Um, let me see if I can just like turn off. Uh, what if I just take out our turbo links? Or any JavaScript in general, but that will, we don't want to get rid of all of that. Let's just see what happens. Hmm. That is so weird. So Turbolinks was definitely doing it. Yeah. Huh. But there has to be a better solution than just deleting that. Oh, Whippecker. Yeah. I'm Googling this to see if this is something that people have. Yeah, give me, let me know your feedback. I wasn't expecting that, so I'm sorry. Where this, <laughs> that was supposed to be the easy part, was just displaying that error on here. Um, and it turned out to be a lot harder than I thought. Um, that's okay. So now you can see kind of the point that I was trying to make is that when we fill this out, we'll get these error messages and they'll give us these things. Um, the other part that I really wanted to show you that I think is super cool is that it will give you, um, you see how we met, kind of messed up our, our formatting here. We've got this weird extra div. It added a div filled with errors around our label and around our text box of the two that were messed up. And this is for CSS styling purposes and it also is for um, accessibility purposes. If, you, if your computer was being read to you um, because you couldn't see, you would want it to be able to guide you to the fields with errors. And so this is the way we always do it is we render the new form so that specifically by getting that instance, like you could imagine we could do a flash message and we could send through the flash message at messages and then iterate over the flash message. The reason we don't do it is because we want these div field with errors to populate around those. And you'll notice they're not around our condition or our brand because we did those correctly. One other thing that you should notice here is that our brand stayed filled in. And so that's the other reason that we want to re-render is by re-rendering, we save any info that was already added correctly, um, which can be very frustrating if you have a really long form and you fill out nine out of the 10 fields correctly, and then it gives you a brand new blank form because you messed up on one field. So this way it would have all nine fields filled in and then the one field that was off. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out, and this is why I really love this documentation, is it even gives you CSS if you wanted to add like a little red border around it. Um, you can copy and paste and based on my success so far, this might not work either. Um, but technically you could come and copy and paste in exactly what they tell you this field with errors and it will add like a little red background um, label to your, to your objects. So let's, let's see if it works. I'm not as, confident it will anymore, but it might. Uh, so let's put in old here and let's, we'll do a few of these so we can really see it. Beautiful, and it just added that CSS for me. I haven't done any work. It has now told me that these two are my ones that are incorrect. And you could, you can do your own CSS, you can edit that, but if you're someone like me that's not really a front end person, um, this is the way that I like to, to handle it. So um, 
just some handy little things that you can all get from that active record validations page. Any questions so far before we dive into some more complex validations? Let me know, Chris, if you find anything. Still looking. Okay. Cool. Well, let's dive into more. These were like the easy ones. So let's dive into some more difficult validations. So we have a ton of options here, and this really does go over like everything. Um, validation wise, and we only have one model, so there's only so much we can do. But let's work on validating um, at the very minimum a price. So I need my price to be an integer. I do not want anything other than an integer submitted for my price. And let's also say maybe my price can't be more than, well, our price can't be less than zero. We know that that's true. So we could add in those pieces as well. So I'm gonna go to my docs and I'm gonna see what options I have. For starters, if you ever want something to be a number, you would add in this, if you just cared about it being a number, we would add in this word num numera, I can't say it, so I'm just gonna type it. Um, num numericality, um, true. If we care a little bit more beyond just it being a number, we can add in our num numericality pointing to some other information, so our, some other constraints. And that's what we're gonna add in today. So we want it, we don't care just that it's a number, we want it to specifically be an integer, so we'll replace that. We also, looking at this list, um, I would really like it to also be, um, maybe we can say all, all of them need to be more than 10. I, we don't have any shoes that are less than $10. So we can add a greater than, and this will look a little bit like, I'm gonna actually do the symbol on the other side, greater than 10. And that should now have added some constraints to our price. Um, one thing that you notice, you get some really good comments down here and they are helpful to read. This comment says that this is not going to allow a nil value. So it's already making sure that our presence is valid. We don't technically also need that presence. In, if I wanted someone to be able to type in a zero, I would have to specifically specify and add in here an allow nil true. Um, but for right now, we'll just leave it as this. So let's go try and test this one out. Uh, we'll add a brand, but our price is only five. Should this work? No. Will it work? We'll see. Perfect. And we get price must be greater than 10. If I try 5.99, now we've got two issues. Oh, it's this, this number field isn't going to let me do it. Um, that, and I, I do want you to know that that kind of, you can add restrictions on this field for a min and a max. They can always be taken off. So these validations take precedence over any front end validations. And what I mean is like, I can come here and I actually, um, I think the syntax for it looks like this, where I can set a minimum value of zero. Let's see if it, oh, I always forget that once I've submitted it, it changes my URL. So now I can't go below zero, and if I try to go below zero, it's gonna tell me that. This is what I consider to be a front end validation because someone that really wanted to not follow your validation could always come into the HTML and inspect that little guy and take off that minimum. They could just say, nope, I don't want that. They could even take this off and say, you know what, I wanna submit text, so I'm gonna change it to a text field and we're gonna submit negative 5.78 because we feel like it. Maybe even some, now we'll just leave it as that. And now we get our other thing, price must be an integer. Um, we also can add custom messages. So let's add a different validation here. Let's validate for, um, I really like doing a uniqueness validation where we care about more than one thing. So, we want people to be able to make many brands. We want people to make many colors. But 
I'm going to add a uniqueness that if that brand and color match has already been added, you can't add it again. So if we are, and I know really if we were dealing with shoes, we would have like Nike freeze and then be like, we couldn't have maybe two pink Nike freeze. We would have another condition in there. Um, but for right now, we'll just deal with it as if our brand and our color can't be the same. So we can't have two pink Nikes. So we could have one pink Nike and one green Nike. Um, and so it's a different kind of uniqueness validation than you maybe are used to. We're gonna go to our handy dandy trusty um, thing in here and I'll scroll back up to the top where we get our list. Let's go take a look at uniqueness. And so in uniqueness, we get a really cool option that is called scope. And that means I'm checking for uniqueness scoped to this other attribute. So I only care about this brand being unique if it has not already been used with that color is essentially the way that the scope works. And so um, we will add something similar to what we see over here in this holiday class. And we can do validate for, uh, we'll say for brand, um, it kind of depends which field you want it to trigger on. If we want it to, which, which one we do as the scope and which one we do as um, the initial one. Let's, we'll do it as color actually, because I think that's where the error should be. Like we've already added a Nike of that color. Um, and then we will list this as uniqueness. But now, I don't know why that one came out. We do a different scope and our scope can be on brand. And um, if we don't add an error message, we might get a kind of weird one here. So let's, let's first try not to add it and then we'll add our own error message. So I'm pretty certain I've done a Nike pink. Um, let's just try it. We'll pass all other validations that we have in here. That one might be frozen. We'll, we'll, we'll do it in this one because I know that this one was working. Um, you shouldn't have to, Nathel Burt. It's probably not a bad idea to, but you should still be able to get uniqueness to work. Um, so we can see that this says color has already been taken. That might be a confusing message to our person. The first word that's going to be here will always be what we told it to validate, even when we write a custom message. But we can change this custom message to say has already um, been used with that brand. So we can make it a little bit unique. And we'll come back here. Um, I just really am trying to emphasize everything you ever need is in, in here. Um, and so this is your go-to as you're writing them if you want custom messages or something of that sort. Um, and so we can add a message. Um, color has already been used with that brand. And then let's try this again. And now we get our new message. Just keep in mind that this first word here is always going to be based on what we're validating. Um, and, and then you kind of like just fill in the rest of the sentence if you add a custom message. And we could add a custom message for any of these, even presents, if we didn't like the way it was being output. We would just add here that what our custom message would be. Um, I've added a number of things so far. Um, any questions or any validations that you would really like to see done? No questions? Okay, cool. Uh, did something just got added in the chat on my custom validations? Okay, uh, I figured you guys would probably ask about that. So I will say for me, the hardest thing about custom validations 
is I have a really hard time coming up with ones that aren't actually things provided for you in here. Um, almost every time I come up with a custom validation, I realize that I actually could have done it with something in here. Um, but let's write a custom validation. So let's say, um, any, I, I might need your guys' help actually on ideas for this. What's something that we, that might not be covered that we wanna check for in here? There's so many things that are already covered by the docs. Cause I would, could say we could only allow certain words here, but that's already checked, covered by the docs. I felt like someone was about to say something. I'm unable to write in the chat for some reason, but maybe like if the input has to be like exactly two words, is oh, there a validation for that? Um, probably not. So let's do that with, you know what, let's do that with um, our color. So we have to like light blue or hot pink or something like that. So we'll make our color a little bit more um, unique. Uh, than what we already have. So there are a lot of ways to do custom validations. One, you can write it in the model itself. Um, you can also make an entire different file for it and then reference that validation. For our purposes, to keep us in one place for right now, we're gonna start just by writing it here in the model. If we write it here in the model, the big difference is all of these other times we've been saying valid dates, we're now gonna say validate singularly, and then we're going to call our unique method that we write. Um, and so let's call it uh, color check, why not? And then we'll come down here and we will define a color check validation. Um, and this can be, it, it can be a little bit messy to do this in the model, and so there, you can also do it elsewhere. I just think for the sake of showing it, it's a little bit easier to do it here. And um, as you can see in your custom validators, you'll see that you can actually make it like a full separate class and define them over there and then include it as if it was like a module. Um, and so there is the syntax and if we have time, we can move it over there as well. Or you can do it straight inside of here like it did in this this bottom one. So we're doing this last example here where we're writing it straight into the model. Um, and so for our color check, what we want to do is basically add an error if they only used one word for the color. Okay, so in here, one thing I want you guys to think about is that this is kind of like an instance method and then in, it's like an instance method or really is an instance method that is going to be run on an at shoe object that has been instantiated but not saved and i like to emphasize that because i think custom validators can be very confusing but i like to point out you actually have access to all of the readers that you would normally have access to so you can call any attributes like at this point in time it will have all of these attributes that we've set, those are all reader methods that we can access. And I think that's a really easy way to think about it is we are inside of an instance method just like an old school Ruby. And so because we're inside of an instance method, we can come over here and we can grab directly the color. And um, this will be giving us a string back. So because it's giving us a string back, what would be a good way to try to figure out how many words in the string there are. Yeah, let's split it. So let's split it on any spaces. And then we can uh, say, um, we'll just say split color. We're gonna save it. We could probably do this in one line, but we're gonna do it in more than one. I like to do it that way and we can always refactor. And basically, yep, this will now be an array of words and it will allow us to know exactly how many words there are. So we will split color and we will count it. Can I not write this? Dot count. And basically if the split color count is greater than, no, is not equal to two. So 
In validations, you always want to check for what you don't want, and then you're going to add the error message. We don't need to check for if it is what we do want. We just check for what it is if it's what we don't want. So we're checking to see if it is not equal to two. If it is not equal to two, what we need to do here is add an error message. That was supposed to be a comment, not an at. There we go. Um, so in adding an error message, what it looks like is we will say errors.add, and nicely we've got our syntax over here. We need to specify what attribute we want it to appear with so we know which attribute is going to be turned red. In this case, it will be our color attribute. And then we will add our message very similar to how our message was done up here. Imagine it's already going to put the word color there. So we say color must be exactly two words. And simple as that, we should now have a, um, a, why can't I think of the word, a custom validator. Um, this can also be thought of like a little bit like a method. Remember, we can call at choose.errors. So this is very similar to like self.errors. I think that throws people off um, is just knowing what you have access to. You can think of this as like self.color that we still have access to um, because we're in an instance method. So then we'll come over here and let's test it. So um, I'm gonna put in something that hasn't been used. I don't think this has been used. We'll put in a different brand. And yay, we get color must be exactly two words. And then let's, let's call it mud brown. And this should successfully create, create a shoe. Perfect. Uh, why did I not put a, put a link to add a new shoe? Let's go back and let's try the opposite. So gross mud brown. Doesn't really matter what we do here. Let's see if it creates it. Nope, color must be exactly two words. Nicely done. Um, did this right here, does this bring up any questions for people? Do we want to do we want to take it and actually make it its own file? Sure, why not? Why not? Cool. So we're like we're going to add it to our concerns file because it's not a model, but it is a concern that will deal with our model. So I will come in here and I'm going to add a new file and I'm going to call this you can kind of decide if you're going to do a custom validator that will validate a bunch of things or if you know that you're going to have a validator that is just going to deal with one attribute and that will kind of depend on how you name it. Let's just call it a color validator for now because we know that that's what we're checking at the moment. Um, come on, save. Perfect. And so this will be class color validator. And we will inherit from active model each validator. Have I done that correctly? Yeah. Oh, this one is validating each record, an attribute, and a value. Um, We could still do it that way. So this is, yeah, this is specifically for individual attributes. So we'll do it this way for our individual attribute. Okay, cool. So we'll call this um, exactly how they have it. We'll just do a validate each. And we now are getting three objects. So because we're not in the class anymore, this would be like our self is our record, our attribute and our value. Uh, and then we will basically, let's take our code from the other one and I'm going to make this look just a little bit nicer. So we'll, we'll do this in one line instead of two. 
And over here, our big difference is now going to be um, our attribute that gets sent in will be our color. So we'll call this our attribute. Um, and then we need to add these errors to our record, so like our self. And let me see, this should be our, has it set up a little bit different? I think I could put attribute here. I'm not positive, we'll, we'll test it. I'm not as confident in, in writing them this way, but let's just see. Um, and then if attribute, really this is if value, not attribute, dot split dot count. Let's see if this works. I'm really not certain because <laughs> I don't usually write it this way. Um, and the, the way we would call this will be a little bit different. Um, yeah. I think you have a typo. I think it should be color validator, not color calidator. I just noticed yeah, that. It should be. You're absolutely correct. Thank you. I don't know if that matters or not. Uh, it matter? it will, it'll matter in a second because we, eh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I really have never done it this way. I've only done it the, the, this way up here and the way down there. So I don't know why I chose this one. We'll see. We'll just see. So in this case, we will validate our color. And someone just called it color true. I know that needs another R. Gosh, my typos today. Um, it doesn't, it looks like it should know because this is, called email. Let's just see. Let's see what happens. We've commented out the other one so we know it's not our color check if it, if it works. Um, let's go ahead and click this. And let's actually add, must be exactly two words from other model, just so we know that this, it is getting our updates and it's not just remembering what we had before. Yes, it worked. Okay, that's kind of exciting. Um, good work, guys. Uh, so cool. So I guess you could do one of these for each of your um, attributes that you had a custom validator for and could bring them in that way. I had never used that before. Question. Yes. Uh, so when we're looking at this, it says validates each, right? So record would represent the self, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. And then the attribute is whatever attribute that self currently has, whether it's color, age, whatever. And value, what is value? What they put in or? Yes, yes. Okay. What they put in. Okay, just wanted to confirm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It is a weird, it's a different way of thinking about it. Um, yeah. And it doesn't, it's, interesting because i think that it knows that this only goes with color like i don't think if we i guess we could probably add this to something else that would be weird um if we wanted something else to have it two two checks i actually am not sure let's let's just see um now i'm really curious um let's see what happens if we do brand color true just to test it out huh Okay, so this, this is good. This is a little test because that tells me that what this is really tracking on is that that is really tracking on the fact that we called this the color validator because both of these now, it now has tested both for our attribute of brand and our attribute of color, which is interesting to see. So this is tracking specifically with what we've named it up here. Any um, last questions? I'm so glad you guys had me put this in a different model because I feel like I've learned something new today. So. Yeah, another quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so early in the chat, I wrote something about the scoping, right? And I remember uh -huh. when I was reading that particular um, documentation about validation, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit further down with inside of there, it says something about, okay, after you do uniqueness, to true or not unique this is true but uniqueness and then you have a scope or it, maybe it's for multiple attributes after I you're talking about this part yeah that's the part 
uh, where you have to create like a unique um, index with inside of your database, uh, linking those together. Huh. So let's say you have scope year and then you add another scope. Um, well, so I want to make sure it's the same year with, uh, you know, I don't know, age, right? It has to be this year with this age for that name. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I, I, I've been using it for a long time and I have never done the indexing. But I think, I, I will say, I think for sure indexing would make it a better check, but it is also working without the indexing. So that's, I don't know, Nathal, but that, you bring up a really great point. Um, because the indexing would make it easier for it to check because then each value is indexed and it can see if the one and the one has happened twice. Um, hmm. I, it, it, that, it's curious because I, I hadn't read that before and it sounds like you are right that I should add an index if I'm doing a scope. Is it because we're using SQL Lite instead of MySQL or Postgred or Postgre? It could, but I would almost expect the opposite to be true, that it would work better <laughs> than the other ones and, and then SQLite. So I don't know. Chris, do you have any thoughts? So many good questions brought up today. Because yeah. <laughs> I've done this scope so many times and it always works, but I've never done an index. Oh, uh, going back to the validator thing, could you change it to like two word validator and then check for that on the model? Probably. Like if I change this to now, that will it matter that this is called something else? I don't know. But you know what? Why not test it out? And then it's a little bit harder because are they going to do the underscores? I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> uh -huh. Are we going to break everything? Maybe. Yep. Unknown validator two words. So I bet you it's this name matters too. Because it is looking for a two word validator. So that is kind of cool. Let's try it one more time. Yeah, great, great point, Mike. So as long as what this name is and the uh, file itself, what that is named, that's going to matter when we call it here. So this is much better. Very cool. Nice work. Um, when we do add other models, one thing I do want to just point out is there always is a validates associated, um, but we'll get into some of that when we deal with like nested forms. Um, just want to point out there are some other pieces to validations, but we just won't see them until we get some other stuff happening here. But basically everything you ever want can be found in this Ruby guides. So in case you didn't grab it already, here it is. Um, take that and have a great rest of your day, guys. I think that's it. Thanks, Jen. Bye, everyone.